representing the, the incense, the prayers and the praises and the, the sacrifice of praise that the saints offered up. And that stood right before another curtain, which beyond that was the holiest of all where the Ark of the Covenant dwelt and God's glory hovered over that mercy seat. And when that priest went in there, he beheld the presence of God Almighty. Folks, there was beauties to behold and wonders to see when he entered in that. And when you enter into Christ, you can look around and think there is an inexhaustible amount of treasures and wisdom. You can't exhaust it. You can't come to an end of it. When people say, well, I would go down, but I, I'm just bored. Need to get born again, you won't get bored. It's just that simple. Why is it that you can get around some church people and they'd rather talk about anything but God? Yeah. Yeah. You get around others and they are very anxious to talk. Let's get into script. Let's talk about, let's discuss anything. Let's talk about our Redeemer and sing of His love that ransomed me. On the cross He paid my pardon. Pay, or how's that song go? On the cross He sealed my pardon paid the debt, and set me free. I don't get tired of talking about that. How can you get tired of talking about that? All of a sudden, things that God has concealed and hid, He begins to open up to that hungry soul. He begins to open up to that one that has a heart for Him. He has a, begins to open up things to the one that can honestly sing. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. Nothing else matters. I'm not entertained by anything else. I'm not blessed by nothing else. I'm in pursuit to know him. Because when Jesus prayed in St. John 17 when he started out, he said this, this is eternal life. I'm going to give you a definition of eternal life that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. That's eternal life. Yes. What was it Jesus said to the workers that we prophesied, cast out devil? He said, depart me, I never knew you. I never had any intimate relationship with you at all. You knew a lot about me, but you didn't know me. Depart from me. But that person that sits down and they can read a verse of scripture and you look up and tears fill their eyes. It blessed them. It fed them. It sustained them. Why? Because they're one of His. They're in Christ. That means something. You can read that to somebody else. And they, yeah, that, 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 that's nice. It doesn't, uh, what he called, doesn't churn their crank. Doesn't touch their heart. It's hid from them. Folks, you needn't look in no seminary to find the hidden treasures of God. You'll find all the wisdom, the very personification of wisdom was in Jesus Christ. Why? For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I don't need to look outside of Him. That's right. I don't need to look at another philosophy. I don't need to look at something that points to another God or anything. I've done found the pearl of great price. Amen. Amen. And you know why I found it? Because he had mercy on me. That's why I found it. That's right. Now, can I go to one more real quick scripture here before I wrap it up? To confirm this point further, I want you to look at Revelation chapter 2. How long have I been talking? Revelation chapter 2. He is addressing seven churches here. This book is a prophecy, so it's prophetic in nature. One of the churches, I don't know if I'm saying this right, but it's in chapter 2, verse 12. It's Pergamos. I've heard some call it Pergamos and all of that. I don't know Pergamos. You know what I'm talking about. And he addresses that church. And to each one of the churches, he talks about the overcomer. 
There's people in, in the midst of these churches that have very serious spiritual problems. But there are people that will overcome those problems. By the power of God, by the mercy of God, by the ability given unto us by God. And in verse 17, he always uses this admonition. He that hath an ear, you say, well, I've got an ear. Well, then you need to hear what the Spirit's saying. If you ain't got one, you can't hear. But if you got one, you need to hear. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of what? Hidden manna. And I'll give him a white stone. And in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth save he himself. He said, I'll give him to eat some hidden manna. You know, that almost sounds like it's not worth looking for. It almost sounds like a hidden manna. I, I don't know what hidden manna. Trust me. If God says it's something that's hid from view of most, manna was something they ate in the wilderness that sustained them and gave them life. So this will be something that will sustain you spiritually and that's more valuable than all the money on the face of this planet. Trust me. And if God says, I got some hidden manna, it means he's got it tucked away somewhere where they don't, nobody know where it's at. But you know what he said he's going to do to you because you've overcome? He's going to let you have some of that manna. All right. <laughs> and when you get it, you're not going to say, well, that was nice, but can we go back to playing a game on the computer? Oh, no. It will revolutionize your walk for that day. You'll begin to sing a song. You'll begin to feel the strength of God bear you up on wings and carry you through very difficult, depressing times that you thought you wasn't going to live through. That hidden manna will feed you like nothing else and you will realize that God doesn't just feed people junk. He doesn't bring you into the storehouse of the Father's love to show you some things that will entertain you for a minute like a spoiled kid. You enjoyed it for five minutes, but now you want a new toy. No, he'll bring you in there and show you things that will fascinate you. That will, leave, that will stick with you for the rest of your life. That you'll look and you'll scratch your head and you'll wonder and you'll think about it. Let me tell you something about the touch of God. I know of a story. I've read it a couple of times. And you can read it if you want to. But years back, uh, a man by the name of Sankey used to accompany D.L. Moody. If I got the story, I think. And they went over into England and preached great revivals. And Mr. Sankey, I think, would, would lead songs or whatever like that. Amen. Well, they, they would go. They didn't want the, the gypsies coming into the, none of the meetings because they they'd steal and pickpocket and they were thieves and everything else. They didn't want them coming in. They were the very ones that needed to come in. But what Mr. Sankey and D.L. Moody would do during the day, they would go out and sing some songs and preach to the gypsies. And one day... There was a little boy that, that, that hung to him and clung to him and, and he was excited by him and they were getting ready to leave. And Mr. Sankey reached down with his hand and just laid his hand on the boy's head. And he, he said, Lord, save this young man and Lord, call him to preach. And they went on and never heard no more about it. Well, Mr. Sankey got near the end of the way. He was bedfast and sick, and, and they knew he wasn't going to last much longer. But word had come to him of a man that they called Gypsy Smith. Yep. You can look him up. That was preaching to enormous crowds. The power of God was, was there, and there were great demonstrations, and people were being convicted. Out of nowhere, conviction just fell, and sinners would come to Christ. And his name was Gypsy Smith. He made his way to America. And he heard that Mr. Sankey was dying. He had always heard about him and wanted to meet him. Well, he goes. And he finds Mr. Sankey. And they're, they're talking, you know, glad to see. Of course, he's, I think, in the bed. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But he was on his last days. And Gypsy Smith, he told him, said, we've heard about you. And he said, I want to ask you. He said, do you remember accompanying uh, D.L. Moody? To uh, uh, you know, England, London area, and said, "Oh, I did it many." And he said, "Well, there was one time you come out and you preached to gypsies and all like that." And he, "Yes, yes, sir." He he said, "I remember that." And he said, "There was a little boy 
that you reached down and laid your hand on and said, save him and call him preaching. Mr. Sankey said, I remember that little boy. And he said, sir, I'm that little boy. Yeah. And he said, he said it's, it, it, I never get over it. I've never gotten over it and never will. But he said, every time I get up to preach, said, I feel the imprint, the touch of your hand on my head. And said, I can feel that steel there. And that touch was not your touch. That was God's touch. And it changed my life forever. And he just looked at him and he said, I'll never get over the wonder of it all. And a man went home that was there listening, went home and wrote a song. You can look it up. It's called The Wonder of It All. Folks, when you eat some of this hidden manna, when you gaze upon the glories of God that are found only in Christ, you've got to have a born-again experience. You've got to have that for yourself. You've got to know Him for you. You can't go on my merits or somebody else's merits or your mom's or dad's or pop's or anybody. You've got to know Jesus Christ for you. And you all know that. But when you do, you know what? That Holy Ghost that abides in you is going to show you precious things in the Word of God that will mean very, very little to a lot of other people. A lot of church folks won't mean nothing to them. Don't you let that discourage you. You realize that's hidden manna. Things he's hid from the wise and prudent, but he's revealed it unto babes. Now, I'm going to flip your, your mind here just a moment. Well, first off, real quickly, Hebrews 11. You all know this verse. The fact that God has chosen you and called you to eternal life does not let you off the hook. It does not mean that you can fold your hands and it'll just all come rolling down the pipe. In fact, people that take that kind of an attitude, uh, they're either off somewhere or another or they show me that God hadn't converted them to begin with. Because David said, as the heart pants after the water brook, even so did my soul thirst after thee, O oh God. Thirsting, longing after God. Never being satisfied. If God gives you a drink of water, you want to go back the next day and drink five gallons of that stuff. Now, in Hebrews 11, he says in verse 6, Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is a rewarder of them that what? Diligently, Diligently seek him. These things will only come to the person that gives diligent seek unto God, that seeks Him diligently, that does not just carelessly uh, sing a song on Sunday morning and go home. No, this will only come to that soul that looks up and deep within their soul. They can't explain it. They don't know where it comes. They don't know why it's still there. They could tell you, like the Brother Tom read that thing, tell you a thousand reasons. I've given God a thousand reasons. I've given Him 40 million reasons not to love me. I've given Him reasons. I'd give up on me if I was Him. But somewhere it just comes and sets in on you and you find yourself, uh, you know, you all go on and do what you're going to do. I've got to look some stuff over here. And you find yourself pouring over the pages, running references, looking up and saying, God, you don't understand. You haven't answered. I'm, I, I want to understand this. I want to understand you. And he says, and you will in due time. Just keep seeking. Well, I don't like the way God does things. Well, get used to it that you're not the one in control. Amen. Now, I've got to stop, but before I do, oops, I messed my place up. Why'd y'all let me do that for? Now, this is my last one. We was going over into Revelation, but I've done killed too much time. How many of you, and you don't have to raise your hand, has listened to somebody, and, and this is good, I, I am not down on this. I'm not down, I'm not criticizing it. But we talk about going to heaven. Won't it be wonderful over there? All in, because the Bible says, I has not seen. 
ears not heard and we've not been revealed what God has prepared for them that love him. Oh, isn't that a great thing? But they stop at that verse. Let's read that verse, okay? It's found in where we was a while ago, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's, let, let's, now I think I've said this before, but how many of you know that little word B-U-T, but? Many times that counters something that said, I like Ben real well, but. What did I just say? I really don't like him. That sort of clarifies a statement before that. It kind of undoes it. You know, well, have you got 1 Corinthians chapter 2? Let's read this. It's read at so many uh, funerals, and we talk to it when we're talking about going to heaven. And it's a good verse of Scripture. Verse 9 says, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Isn't that awesome? But why don't you read the next verse? Let's not stop right there. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Did you, did I, did, am I missed something here? I have not seen, ear, not heard, but God showed it to us by his Spirit. There are revelations that you can receive from the Spirit that this world does not know a thing about. Don't want to know a thing about. And if you showed it to them, it wouldn't mean nothing to them. No way. Amen. But the hidden manna. Do you realize that holy place in that tabernacle where the priests went every day to minister in that first compartment? There was a table of showbread. There was the altar of incense. And there was the seven golden lamps stand with oil in it and burnt all the time. Which provided the only light that there was in the place. But there was on that table showbread. It was a bread that was only for a chosen priesthood to eat. And Peter said, you're a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. Amen. God has some food. God has some things for you to, to take into your spirit, into your soul spiritually, and ingest these and eat them. And didn't he say, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, there's no life in you. Well, I got news for you. There's some things that only somebody that God in his great, awesome, powerful mercy has reached down in love and took and smacked their eyes and smeared eye salve on them so they can see. Those are the only ones that behold these wondrous glories and beauties that you find in Jesus Christ. And when you do, you go, good lands. Wow. And brother, I tell you the truth. It causes a person to, to stand in awe and amazement. Eyes not seen. Ears not heard. But the Spirit of God revealed it to us. No wonder Paul said in another place, We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Christ in you is your hope of glory. I want you to know what, what better could you ask for than to have this great heavenly guest not sitting on a chair beside of you, but dwelling in you. Yeah. Now, I'm not down in this felt, but I heard a guy on YouTube that was sent to me, and, and he said that he had an experience and said the Lord spoke to him and said, sit down on the couch, I want to talk to you a minute. And, and, that's, and he said, Jesus sat right there on the couch and talked to him. That may have happened. I, I'm not going to, but I, I don't mean to be in, in competition here, but I got one better than that. He ain't sitting on my couch talking to me. He's sitting on the inside of me. He said, if any man will hear my voice, I'll come in and I'll sit down and sup with him and he with me. I'll talk with you. I'll say, come here a minute. Let me show you something. And he'll just sort of bend that Bible back. Hey, wait, 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 wait. Don't, don't close it. Oh, no, that's, that's enough for the moment. 
Now I've got to go. Where are you going? Nowhere. I'm barely going to just stay right here. He don't ever leave me. And he walks with me. And he talks with me. A long life's narrow way. He lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. Yes, amen. He ain't going to sit down on my couch and have a talk with me. He communes with me in my spirit. And you know what? All I got to do is turn my mind to him. And he's right there ready to commune. There's been little tidbits that's dropped to me out of the scripture when I went. I, I got to find Lisa. Where did I put that? Yeah, it makes me think of that script. Does that say that? Flip, flip, flip. Wow. And all of a sudden, I go to singing. Why? Because what he just come out of the blue and shared with me blessed me to the point I got to sing about it. Oh, what a redeemer. What a savior. What a call to rejoice. And to, to be thankful in our hearts because I'm redeemed by love, divine glory, glory, Christ is mine. All to him I now resign. I've been redeemed. And he's opened up the storehouse of his love and said, come and dine. Come and feast at the table of the king for all things are ready. They're here for you. Well, what do I have to do? Nothing. I done done it for you. Let's sing, guys. <laughs>